All right, and I think I think that's about it. So let's get started. Uh, welcome everyone, thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Andrew, I'm a VCIO, and that uh, means I mostly talk about IT strategy with business leaders, uh, build roadmaps, and uh, just do general consulting on, on IT solutions and, you know, what products should people use, that sort of thing. Um, Smart Dolphins is a managed service provider in BC serving medium-sized businesses, and we're always looking for ways to serve our clients and the wider community better. Um, and as IT becomes more central to our working lives, um, I think it's important for us as IT people to recognize that evolving role. Uh, more than just people who can fix things, um, we have a responsibility as educators and to help everyone sort of understand how IT can be leveraged to improve lives, not just on sort of an organization wide level, but on an individual level as well. Um, the tools that we use every day have so much power lurking under the surface. Uh, Excel is a great example of that. Yes. And it's often just a matter of understanding what the tools can do for you to unlock that potential. So oftentimes the features aren't especially difficult, but just need a little bit of focused attention and especially a bit of guidance uh, to point you in the right direction. And you'll find ways to do the best work that you can, uh, not just for the business, but in your community generally. Uh, and with that goal in mind, we bring you today's presentation. I uh, have a couple of upcoming training events I want to share with everyone before we get started. We have the cybersecurity user level training coming up on October 27th. I think that's a, exactly one week from now. And that's something we generally recommend everyone go to. Uh, we're starting to see in cyber insurance surveys, uh, they're actually requiring or recommending that people attend that yearly. And we have some uh, clients who use this as a part of their sort of employee onboarding process. Uh, and I think it's a really great idea. Uh, we have Visio online. I think that's the first time we're running that one on Friday, November 4th. And then uh, Microsoft Teams, which uh, I'm sure everyone has experienced one way or another. There's a lot you can do there. That is on November 9th. And uh, yeah, before we begin, I'd like to have a couple notes. Uh, put your questions in the chat. Uh, I'll interrupt Julian while she's going along and inject those as necessary, but we'll have a QA period at the end if you would prefer to, you know, if a question that's sort of, you know, a tangent or, or whatever, uh, we have some time at the end to save the larger questions for. Uh, and then we'll be sending out an event recording and a feedback survey after that we'd be really grateful if you could send back to us uh, as we're always looking for ways to make this better for everybody. So uh, before we get going, I want to introduce Jo Lynn. Uh, she's been teaching Microsoft apps since they were first released. Uh, she's a master instructor and certified trainer with over 30 years of experience. She teaches on the basics to advanced features on programs like Teams, Excel, SharePoint, Outlook, OneDrive, and more. Thank you for being here, Jolyn. Thank you very much, Andrew. Welcome, everybody, to Excel Beyond the Basics. So um, if you did download that handout, which I hope you did, um, if you want to take a look at, there's a table of contents at the beginning of that handout, and that will give you an idea as to uh, what topics we will be discussing during our session here today. I do have probably more information than, of course, what I'm going to say during the session. So it would be a great re reference tool for you to use after you get done as well. So at the beginning of the handout, it's talking about a feature called named ranges. So named ranges has been around for quite a long time in Excel, but I don't think I see enough people taking advantage of this feature. So let me explain first what it is, and then we'll explain how to create it. So a named range is where we could click on a cell or select multiple cells and give them an actual name. So instead of referring to cell C15 as C15, we can actually give it a real name. So we're going to do a couple of those in this worksheet called references, where we're going to be going to cell G1. And we want to be able to use this in a formula. We want the formula to be easier to read. So we're going to name the cell G1 sales goal. So that when we use it in a formula, people will see that it says sales goal, and it's going to make using the formula reading it much easier to understand. Also, when you name a cell, it also becomes an absolute reference. So if you've been using dollar signs to lock a cell down, instead, if you name it, it automatically becomes an absolute reference. So that's another benefit. Another benefit to naming a range of cells is if you're going to be creating multiple formulas on the same range of cells over and over again, it just makes it easier than having to go back and select the cells over and over again. Because could you imagine if you had 10,000 
uh, rows inside a column that you were using with 10 different formulas and you'd have to keep going back and selecting them. It's just easier if you select them once, give them a name, and then you can keep reusing them. One more benefit that I'll mention right now is that we can use a named range to navigate throughout a worksheet, or I should say workbook. So we can use it to navigate to different parts of your actual workbook. And a named range is available in any sheet within its workbook. So we don't have to go back and select the, the sheet and the cell to use it. We just type in the name of the range. So how we name ranges, there's a couple of different ways to actually do it. Starting out, we're just going to use the name box. So when you look at the right underneath the ribbon on the left hand side, it says the name of your active cell. I'm on G1 of the references worksheet and I'm going to click in the name box and I'm going to name this sales goal. There's some rules to naming a cell. There cannot be any spaces in the name. You could use underscore if you want. You can use uppercase, lowercase text. You can name it up to 255 characters long, but shorter is probably a little bit better. But you want to name it so that you know what it is. You can also not name it based on a cell reference. So because of the fact that we have over 16,000 columns across and over a million rows going down, we would not be able to name a cell QTR1 because that's actually a cell reference. OK, so once I click in the name box, I'm going to type sales goal. Once again, no spaces. I'm just using uppercase, lowercase to separate my words. Then I'm going to press enter. Once you press enter, that cell is now being seen as sales goal. OK, and then I'm going to click in cell G2. I'm going to click in cell G2. And I want to use that in a formula as well. And I know I'm going to be copying the formula. So I want it to become an absolute reference. So I'm going to name that cell also. I'm going to name it commission rate. So I'm on G2. I'm going to click in the name box. I'm going to type commission rate. Now I'm going to use those both in a formula. So, and we're going to come back and talk more and more about named ranges as we go through the session here today. But just so you know, guidelines for your names, how to name it, how to edit or delete, that information is included in your handout. But what I want to do right now is I want to create a formula in column G that is actually going to use the commission, the commission rate that we just named. So I'm going to start on G5. Now I only have three people. It's not that big of a deal, but imagine if I had 10,000 rows that I wanted to copy this down for. So I'm just going to do equal F5 asterisk CO. As soon as I type CO, it of course brings up all the functions that begin with the letters CO. They have a circle with the FX in front of them. But you'll notice that commission rate has the squares with the blue. That lets you know that that's a named range. If I double click on commission rate, it will type the rest of it in. And you could see based on the color coding that it's using cell G2. I'm going to control enter to stay on that cell and complete my formula. And you'll see your answer with the formula in the formula bar showing commission rate. Now, of course, I can copy it down for my other employees. And because it's an absolute reference, it's going to automatically copy all the way down. Now, we'll do a few more examples. Um, let me do one more example on this worksheet. Then we'll talk about a couple of other things and throw in another named range scenario here. But let's use sales goal. Um, let's actually say that we want, and as a matter of fact, let's change our sales goal. Well, no, we'll keep it. Because let's say that we want to have the computer look at all of the totals for the quarter one through quarter four to see how many of these actually are greater than or equal to the sales goal. We want to see how many are greater than or equal to the sales goal. 
So each quarter had a goal of $6,500. I'm just going to go to sell I-5. I'm going to go to sell I-5. And I'm actually going to create a formula using a count if function. Now, if you're not familiar with the if functions, we'll do a couple of them today. But I'm going to do as equal COU to narrow my list down to the functions that begin with those letters. And I'm going to double click on count if, where basically what this is looking for is what is the range of cells you want me to evaluate and what is the criteria? So what we're going to do is our range of cells is actually going to be B5 through E7, oops, B5 through E7, comma, the criteria is actually going to be the, the sales goal needs to be greater than or equal to. So I want to show you something. Once you start a formula, if you're not 100% sure what you're supposed to be putting in for each of the separate arguments, you could always click on FX. So just so you can see that you could do this, if I click FX, it opens up the function arguments window where it's going to separate a, a different row for every argument in the formula. So if I go into the criteria, if I'm not quite sure what I'm supposed to do here, in the middle of the window, it's going to actually show you. I will tell you, give you a description. So basically, the criteria is the condition in which we want to define the cells that we want to count. So which cells do we want the computer to count for us? We want it to only count if the number in each of those individual cells is greater than or equal to the sales goal. So greater than equal sales goal. So I clicked on G1 and it put the named range in there for me. If I click OK, what this just did was it actually gave me a zero. So it's basically saying that there are no cells that are greater than or equal to the sales goal. Well, that's not actually true because when we do this formula and we wanted to count that range of cells, we wanted to count if there is. But the way that I put the formula in is incorrect. So I'm going to jump back in here and I'm going to take out this criteria here for you. And counting is if we only wanted to count if the sales goal, the 6,500, if it's great, greater than or equal 6,500. So if I say greater than equal 6,500, it's going to show me the correct answer. It doesn't like the named range. It wants us to use the actual value instead. Kind of strange. So if you don't get the right answer, it can be because of the type of formula you're creating. Now we'll see a couple of more examples of that here in a minute. But before we do that, I wanna go over to the worksheet called orders. And on this worksheet called orders, we're gonna create yet another named range because we're gonna use it in a few formulas. So what this is, is it's over 1400 um, rows going down and it's including just a bunch of orders for some products. So it's got who the company is, what country they're in, et cetera. What I want you to do is we're gonna actually name the cells for the extended price because we're gonna create a couple of formulas using the extended price. So I'm gonna click on I2. And I want to select all the way down to the bottom of that list. And I'm going to do it with a shortcut. I'm going to do shift control down arrow. And that will select all the way down to the bottom of that row, that column, to the row 1,465. Now that I have that range selected, I want to call this extended price. So I'm going to click in the name box again. I'm going to type in extended price and press enter. So now that entire range of cells is called extended price, okay? And then we're gonna use those in formulas over in K1 and L1. And what we're gonna do first in K1 is we're just gonna create a regular sum of the extended prices. So you could either click on your auto sum button if you wanted to to get started, or of course do equal S, that kind of a thing. 
Um, I just clicked on the auto sum because I don't like to type if I don't have to. <laughs> but then I'm going to put in extended price. So if I do EX, I can see extended price. I'm going to double click on it. I didn't spell it right, but that's okay. Um, I double clicked on it and it selected that whole entire column. I'm going to do control enter and I'm going to see the answer of the sum of all of those extended prices. Okay. But we're going to do another formula that's also going to add those extended prices. But this time we're going to go to L1. And what we're going to do here is we're going to create a formula using a subtotal. All of these are in your book, by the way. I'll point those out as we go through. But on L1, we're going to do equal SU. And from the drop down menu of all your functions, I'm going to double click on subtotal. The subtotal function can do multiple functions. <laughs> so you're going to see a list of 1 through 11. And what these are, are the average, the count, the min, max, the product, et cetera. We want it to add, so we're going to do sum. So I'm going to double click on nine dash sum. Nine is actually the hidden code to the computer to let it know which function we want it to do. Then I need to put in a comma and tell it, well, what is the range of cells that we want to add together? And that's going to be the extended price again. So I'm going to type an E, X, and I'm going to double click on extended price again, and I'm going to control enter. I will end up having exactly the same answer as I did with the sum. So you're probably wondering, why would I do a subtotal instead of just doing a sum? Well, in your handout on page two, it talks about some very common features when you are using a lot of columns and rows of information. One is called freeze panes. So what that means is as we scroll down on a list, we can no longer see the headings up in the top. So we could freeze the screen on a certain row and or column so that we can always see that row or those columns. We can do that multiple ways. Um, if we go to the view tab of the ribbon, my top row right now is row one, and that's what I want to freeze. So from the view tab, I'm going to go to the window group and I'm going to click on freeze panes. Then I'm just going to say freeze top row. So whatever is my visible top row, it will freeze it so that as I scroll down, that row stays visible to me all the time. And another thing that we usually do in a situation like this is we do sorting and filtering. So let's say that I actually want to sort by country. I could click inside that column for country. So I just clicked on B4. And I could go to my data tab of the ribbon. In the sort and filter group, I'm just going to simply click A to Z. It keeps all of your rows of information together. They're basically called a record. And so it keeps all of that together as it sorts. Andrew, did you have a question or a comment? Yeah, Amy Peters is asking, uh, can you freeze multiple columns at once? Uh, when I try, I can only do one column. Good question. Actually, very good question. I'm going to go back and unfreeze what I just did by going back to my view tab. And then I'm going to actually click freeze panes again. Then I'm going to unfreeze panes. So let's say that I have a lot of columns going across and I have a couple of rows at the top that I want to have visible to me all the time. We can freeze any number of columns and any number of rows. It all depends on where your active cell is. You want to click in the row below what you want to freeze. So if I want to freeze rows one and two, I need to be in row three. If I want to freeze columns A and B, I want to be in column C. Because if I am on C3, it's going to freeze every row above me and every column to the left of me so that when I scroll to the right, those two columns will stay visible. So once I'm on C3, I can go back to the view tab, back to the freeze panes, then I can click on freeze panes. When I click on freeze panes, I can now scroll down and rows one and two stay visible. Or if I scroll to the right, 
A and B stay visible. So we can freeze as many columns and as many rows as you want, okay? If you change your mind and you wanna take it back off again, just go back to freeze paints and click on freeze paints, okay? So I hope that helped. So when it comes to sorting your information, sometimes I'm using that data tab to just go sort A to Z, Z to A kind of a thing, but I'm usually going to be filtering as well. So I'm going to actually turn my filters on. So from the data tab, I'm going to click on the icon for filter, and it's going to give me drop down arrows for each of my column headings in row one, because it's smart enough to know that that's headings. So from your drop down, if I go to the salesperson, what this is going to show me is a unique list of every salesperson. And this is actually a good a good tool to use because what if somebody entered in instead of Robert King, they call him Bob. So somebody was entering Bob King. That's two different entries, but the same person. We would see Bob King listed as well as Robert King. So we know we have to fix some of those cells. So I like the fact that it gives you a list of the unique values. But if I wanted to sort by this column, I could do so right at the top, A to Z, Z to A. Or if I want to just see specific people, I can filter the list to only show me who I want to see. So I can uncheck the select all. Then let's say I want to see Laura Callahan and Robert King. I click in front of their names, click OK, and it has now filtered my list to only show me the records that match those names. If I look on the left, my row numbers are blue. It's basically hiding the rows that don't match my criteria. And if you look at your status bar down at the bottom left, it's going to tell me that there are 289 records that match my criteria of those two names, and uh, it's out of a total of 1,464 records. I like that it tells me that. Did you notice anything else that was going on as I filtered this information? Take a look at your formulas that we did. The subtotal formula changed because the subtotal changes when you filter your data. So the subtotal is based on the filtered records not all of the records. The sum is based on every row, but the subtotal is not. So I use both of them because I always wanna see the grand total, but then I really wanna see just based on the records I'm looking at. Now, one thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna filter a filter. If you're a database person, we always query a query to query a query. <laughs> Here we can filter a filter to filter a filter to really narrow down exactly what you wanna see. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna to go to the quantity and I'm gonna say, I only wanna see if the quantity is uh, 50 or more. I only wanna see the orders for these two salespeople if they have a quantity of 50 or more. When I click on the drop down for quantity, you're gonna see your unique list of all those quantities. It would be extremely hard to uncheck all those kind. So what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to hesitate where it says number filters. Okay. By the way, Excel is very smart. It knows what kind of data mm -hmm. is in every column. So if it's text, it gives you text filters. If it's numbers, it gives you number filters. If it's dates, it gives you date filters. So when I hesitate on number filters, I see on my cascading menu, I have multiple choices. I'm going to choose greater than or equal. I'm going to choose greater than or equal. And in the custom auto, auto filter, I'm going to type 50. Then I'm going to click OK. So now I filtered the filter to only show if it's Robert King or Laura Callahan, and if they had an order that was 50 or more for the quantity. So now, of course, my L1 subtotal function also has changed because it will continue to change as we filter our filters or clear our filters, et cetera, okay? If I'm done and I wanna bring back all my records again, I can just go back to the data tab of the ribbon, click on clear and it will clear out all filters I had applied. 
Otherwise, I could go back to the drop down and clear individual uh, filters as well, whichever way you want for whatever result you're looking for. So in your handout that started on page two, talking about doing filtering and then over to uh, page four, no, page three talks about the filtering with the subtotal function. And at the bottom of page three, it's actually giving you uh, the description of what number belongs to which function. OK, but of course, we don't have to memorize that because we get it when we do the formula. It automatically populates it for us. So we don't have to memorize it. OK, but I want to go to our next topic on page four. It talks about using an Excel table. So a lot of times when we have a range of information that we're working with, we're going to need to format it. We might need to add some totals at the bottom. Um, we want to freeze panes. We want our headings to look different. Um, we may want to have it sorted and filtered. That's a lot of things that we would have to do individually. I personally don't like to do all of that individually. I would rather the computer does all the work for me. So what we're going to do is I'm going to go to the dates worksheet. And here on the dates worksheet, we have a list of different employees. And I can see that row three has already been formatted as headings, but I don't have any sorting, filtering, or freeze panes. And as this list continues to grow, I'm definitely going to want freeze panes. So first, I'm going to, just for understanding this a little bit better, I'm actually going to get rid of the formatting on the headings in row three. So I'm selecting those headings. I'm going to go back to the home tab of the ribbon. And on the right hand side in the editing group, I'm going to click on clear and then formats. That will take all the formatting off of those cells because I want it to just be raw data. So nothing is really formatted. Then if you are in a cell within your range of your data, you can turn this into a table. There's a couple of ways to do that. But an easy way is just go to your insert tab of the ribbon. And from there, you can click on the left-hand side, click on the icon for table. It recognizes your range of cells, and it's going to put it in the where is your data. I'm going to click OK, and I now have a table. As soon as I click to unselect it, I can see that the heading is different than the rest of the rows. And the formatting for the rows is that every other row looks different. And in row three, it gave me the drop downs for the filters. So I get my filters on, on sorting automatically. And if I scroll down, it freezes the headings from row three. It actually changes it from saying A, B, C, D to say in the actual name of each column. But let's take this a little bit further because maybe you don't care for the colors that are being used. You have a new tab on the ribbon called the table design tab. From that tab, you have several tools you can use to help manage the table. In the table style options group, there's a check mark in front of header row and banded rows. Banded rows means every other row will be emphasized differently. And the best part is when you filter, it keeps every other row being emphasized. So if I go to department and I click on the drop down and I only want to see facilities and development, I can click in front of those two, click OK, and that's the only records of information I'll see. But the formatting stays with it. Pretty cool. Now I'm just going to go ahead and clear that filter from department to bring them all back again. And a couple of other things to think about using is what if I don't want every other row emphasized? I could uncheck banded rows and check banded columns instead so that every other column could be emphasized. Or I could uncheck that and check last column, first column, although we don't have any data in those columns, um, it would format those to look different than the rest of the, the columns. I'm going to actually turn banded rows back on because whatever you have checked in that table style options group is actually changing the table styles gallery of choices on the right hand side. So you can see these different icons. And as I hesitate on them, you can get a live preview to see what it would look like. 
There's more. So if you click on the drop down on the right for more, there's light, medium, and dark categories. So if you would prefer to use a different formatting color, you can go ahead and choose whatever you want. What you're seeing in the table styles matches whatever you have checked in the table style options. So as an example, if I click first column, it's now updated the styles to match first column. Or if I do last column, the styles match. So if I uncheck them, it changes the styles to match again. So that's kind of cool. And then also in the table style options, you have a total row. If you click total row, it's going to add a row at the bottom that will automatically allow you to do formulas in that row. So let's say that I go to the department column. I click at that total row. You get a drop down arrow showing you the functions that are available from this total row. So if I wanted to count how many records there are, that's about all we could do because we don't really have adding and subtracting options here. Um, it will tell us exactly how many employees are in that list. So it does a count. So a table is a great way to really kind of give yourselves multiple benefits in one. It gives you the filtering, sorting. It gives you the freeze panes. It gives you the formatting. So you get the colors and everything. Plus it gives you the ability to have the total row. But if I don't want the total row, I just uncheck it again. And that's another great part of using a table is that we can change our mind all the time. And if we change our mind on having this be in a table, because maybe I'm going to do a legacy share feature or something, and I don't want this to be a table anymore, we can remove the table. If I go back up to the table design tab, on the left-hand side in the tools group, I could click convert to range. And it's going to say, are you sure you want to convert this back to normal? If I click yes, it's back to being just regular cells again. The table tools on the ribbon will be gone, but the formatting stayed. The formatting stayed. Now, of course, we could clear it out if we wanted to, but I'll leave it for now. So tables are a great option to give you several things all in one, several things all in one, okay? Well, let's move on to a few formulas, a few more formulas. If you look in your handout on page five, it talks about your function arguments window. That was where if you click on the FX, but the FX does different things depending on when you click on it. If I am just on a blank cell somewhere, and I click FX, it doesn't know what type of a formula I want to do. So it brings up the insert function window where you could then find the function you want to, to, to work with. So if I'm on a function from this list that I wanna use, all I have to do is click okay. And it takes me into the function arguments window, which I call the helper window because it will help you build the formula, okay? But if I'm on a cell and I start a formula, and let's say I'm just going to do an if, as soon as I start a formula, if I look at the syntax underneath, and I'm not quite sure what I'm supposed to do, I could click on FX, because that's going to take me straight into the function arguments window to help me build the formula. Every row is going to be a separate argument. and in the middle, it's going to give you a description on how to use that formula or that argument. If you need additional help, at the bottom left of this window, you can always click help on this function. It will take you into the internet. Let me drag that back over here for you. It will take you into the internet and show you the information related to using that particular function. It will give you videos sometimes. It gives you different examples of how to use it. It breaks apart the arguments for you, the entire syntax. So I really like that helper window because it truly does help build your formulas. Okay. Now, I'm not going to do that right now, but I just wanted to introduce you to the FX and show you how it's different depending on how you start your formula. 
or if you start your formula. If you go to the uh, formulas tab of the ribbon, there is a function library group. And this will give you the different categories of all the functions that are available within Excel. So this is going to help you to kind of narrow down if you're looking for a function. So let's say that I'm on a blank cell and I go to logical. And if I'm looking at these functions and I say, you know what, I think I want to use if s. If I click on it, it's going to automatically take me into my function arguments window. Just so you're seeing there's multiple ways to actually get in there. Okay. Now I'm just going to click cancel for right now. I just wanted to introduce you to that. So the function library group is a great place to go to see what functions do we have. So there's over 400 functions. Every time there's a new version of Excel, they come out with more new functions. So it'll always grow. They don't take away most of the old ones unless they're replacing it, which I think they'll be replacing a few of these coming up. But, <laughs> but let's talk about using some of these functions. As a matter of fact, let's actually go to the worksheet called, let's go back to orders again. Let's go back to the worksheet called orders. And what we're going to do first is we're going to do an if function. And what an if function does is it has something that it's going to evaluate. And then it is going to give you an answer. If whatever we evaluate is true, we can have one answer. But if whatever we're evaluating is false, we could have a different answer. So let's say that we want to have it look at the quantity. And if the quantity is 50 or more, we want to say great job. But if it's less than 50, we're going to have it say sell more or whatever we would want it to do. The true answer or the false answer can be text or it could actually be a formula. It could be a number. It could be whatever you want it to be. So we're going to start on J2. We're going to do equal the letter I. Then I just press my tab key when I was on if, and it starts the formula. So when you look at the syntax, we're on the logical test. And what we want it to look at is H2. We want it to look at H2. And if H2 is greater than or equal to 50, if H2 is greater than or equal to 50. Now, this is a type of formula that I personally would go into the insert function. So I'm going to click FX. And you'll see why after we create this formula. Because every argument is going to be separated by a comma. And every time we use text in a formula, it has to be in quotes. And I just personally don't care to type all of that. Here in the function arguments window, we don't have to worry about that. The computer will do all of that for us. So I'm going to go into the value if true. So if H2 is greater than or equal to 50, if that's true, I'm going to say great job. But if it's false, I'm going to say sell more. Okay. Oops, type that, spell it correctly. You can use spaces when you do text. The computer is adding quotes around the text. I'm going to click OK. If I look at the formula bar, it put quotes around the sell more also. I can see that this particular one is sell more because if I look at the quantity of seven, they didn't sell 50 or more. If I copy this formula down by double clicking on the fill handle, it will copy it down for every cell going all the way down through 1400. And you'll be able to see which one said great job. So those are the ones that would have the quantity that is greater than 50, greater than or equal to 50. There are a lot of choices when it comes to using if functions, a lot of choices. Another example is, let's say that we want to get the sum of the extended prices, but only if the quantity is greater than or equal to 50. 
So we want to add together all of the extended prices, but only if the quantity is greater than or equal to 50. We can use a function called sum if. So I'm just going to be on K2. I'm going to do equal SU. I'm going to double click on sum if. I'm going to click on FX to use the helper window. And what it's looking for first is what is the range you want me to evaluate? That's going to be the quantities. So I'm going to click on H2. I'm going to do shift control down arrow to select all those going all the way down. It will add that range. I'm going to click in the criteria and I'm going to say greater than equal 50. So it's going to look at all those quantities. If the number is greater than or equal to 50, we're going to go to the sum range and tell it, well, what are the cells that we wanted to add together? The extended price is what we wanted to add together. Now it is a named range, so I don't have to select it. I could physically type it if I wanted to, or I can get a pop-up menu by doing F3. F3 is a keyboard shortcut, your function key, that it will give you a list of your named ranges. I can then double click on extended price, however I typed it in. Once I'm done, I click OK. And now I get an answer where it's only adding together all of the extended prices if it said 50 or more in the quantity, in the quantity. So if I filter by quantity and I say I only want to see it if it's greater than or equal to 50, these are the cells that it's actually adding together, all of these. So just so you get an understanding as to how does it determine which cells, this is the cells that it's actually adding together. So let me scroll back up and I can see that my answer on L1 matches my answer down here in the formula bar. And if I look at my formula, I have to, oops, sorry, I didn't mean to escape that. Let me undo that. I'm going to go back and get rid of my filter from my uh, quantity. So that number matched what we saw in the subtotal, as well as my answer down at the bottom. So there's a lot of different functions related to evaluate this. And if that's true, do this. But if it's not true, it's false. Instead, do this. So great choices to be using. The sum if, the count if, Average if are all explained in your handout on page six, on page six, okay? We're gonna jump back to the dates worksheet again. We're gonna jump back to the dates worksheet. And I'm not sure if you've ever used this feature before, but at the top of page eight, it talks about a feature called flash fill. What the flash fill allows you to do is to give the computer a pattern and then it's going to follow your pattern. What we're going to do in this dates worksheet is we're going to figure out um, what the extension is for each employee. And that's in column I. The extension is actually coming from column H. It's the last four numbers in column H. We could either use a flash fill to have it fill in all the extensions for us, or we could use a formula to do it, a formula called right, R-I-G-H-T. It's a text formula. But I want to show you this flash fill first. So what we're going to do is on I-4, I'm actually going to type in the first extension, which is in the H column, the last four numbers. So the first one is 2099. Then I'm going to control enter to stay on that cell. I'm going to go to the ribbon to the data tab. And from the data tab, I'm going to go to the data tools group and click on the icon called flash fill. It follows my pattern going all the way down because it says, hey, I see this number. I'm assuming you want me to go all the way down with the same pattern for each of the employees going down. So it automatically copies them down. It's so smart that we could even go to J4 and have it grab the building out of column H where it says lab central, et cetera. So if I'm on J4 and I give it the pattern of the first one, 
I type lab. I'm going to control enter to stay on that cell. I'm going to click on flash fill again. It follows my pattern all the way down. Pretty cool that it can do that. I love this feature. But it even has a better feature than these two examples. I'm going to go to column A. And you can see that column B and column C include the last name and the first name and their uppercase. We want them to be proper casing where it's going to just capitalize the first letter of the names. And we want to use the flash fill to do it. So I'm going to put in the first one. I'm going to type Erica space Decker because I want them to be in one cell together, starting with their first name, space, then last name. And I'm capitalizing the first letter of each. This time I'm going to do a flash fill, but I'm going to press enter. When I press enter, I could type the first letter of the next person. So A for Angela. And it looks and it says, hey, I see a pattern with this. If that's what I want to do, I press enter and it automatically will fill those in for me. So flash fill is a great option if that's something that you work with is lists like this. Okay. So many great choices built into Excel. The program is pretty smart. Now I want to do another formula with you. And this formula is also going to be on page eight, where it starts to talk about lookup and reference functions, where first it's talking about a function called an H lookup. We're going to go to the worksheet called lookup. And on that lookup worksheet, we're going to be looking up the data within our employee list. And there's a named range for this. So let me show you that. If you go to your name box, click on the drop down arrow you're going to see a list of your named ranges. Remember the ones we created earlier? If I click sales goal, it's going to automatically jump me back to that sheet to the cell that we named sales goal. If I go back to the drop down again and I click employee underscore info, it's going to bring me back to the lookup worksheet and it selects the range of cells that are a part of that named range. So we're going to use that or see it in formulas. We have a, a search criteria up at the top in row six, where we are looking up an employee ID number. Next to it, it's finding the name of the employee by using what is referred to as a V lookup. H lookup stands for horizontal, where it's going to look down in rows. We have a V lookup that looks across the columns. V lookup is probably the more popular choice that people will use. But it has some downfalls to it. So I'm going to show you an alternative to it that is new. So when I look at this formula on B6, what this formula is doing, let me double click on it so you see the entire formula. But what it's doing is it's looking up A6, which is the employee ID number. It's looking in the range of cells called employee underscore info. It's looking in the first column of that range to find that employee ID number. Once it finds the ID number, it looks across to the second column to find the name that matches the employee ID number. So the two is referring to the second column in that range. The first column is employee ID, second is the name. The false at the end is saying that we want it to be an exact lookup, an exact lookup. So that if that employee ID number is not in the list, we would get an error. We would get an error. Now, we have another one on cell C6 doing the same thing, looking up the, that employee ID number within that employee info range. But this time it has a comma five. It's looking at the fifth column across that range. Employee ID is one, name is two, region is three, department is four. Earnings is the fifth column across. I personally don't care to count. I don't like to have to count my columns across. I'll give you an alternative to that. But I want to show you how this VLOOKUP works. I'm going to go to cell D6. And I want to find the earnings for, well, actually, I just did the earnings. That one should have been over here. <laughs> I'll do the department. I just move that over to earnings. And I'll say that I want to find the department. So I'm on C6. 
I'm going to look for the department. I'm going to do equal V, the letter V. I'm going to double click on V lookup. It wants to know what is my lookup value. That's going to be A6, comma. Where do I want it to look? That's called the table array, which is a fancy way of saying where's the range of cells you want me to look in. We have a named range called employee info. So I'm going to put employee info in there as to where it should look. Comma, oops, I didn't finish it, sorry. Comma, I want it to find the department. So I have to count the columns across to find department. Employee ID, name, region, department. So I would put in a four. If I follow that with a comma, I will get true or false. True means an approximate lookup where it would drop down to the next lowest value or false would be an exact lookup so that if the number isn't there for the lookup value, it will give us an error. So you don't have to memorize which one is which, you will see that. So I'm gonna double click on false. Then I'm gonna control enter and it automatically finds the department name matching up to the employee ID that I'm looking up, okay? But if I go to A6, it actually has a drop down arrow coming from data validation. If I switch to a different employee ID number, every one of these formulas will automatically update, which is pretty cool. But this V lookup and an H lookup, they're both great, but the problem with them is the fact that we have to count the columns across. And what it is looking up has to be the first column in the range. So instead, we have other ways that we can actually do this formula. Let's say that we wanted to look up the name that we have in cell B6. And we want it to bring back the region, the department, and the earnings all in one. We can do that by using what is called an X lookup. You have uh, several pieces of information in your book on an X lookup, as well as the H and the V lookups. So it gives you the syntax starting on page 11 of your handout for this X lookup and a few examples of it. But if I go to G6, if I go to cell G6, maybe I want it to find the name, the region, the department and the earnings. I could have it look up the employee ID if I wanted to. Or I could say, look up the name and bring back the region, the department and the earnings. However you wanna do it, it will do whatever you need. It doesn't have to be the first column that it's looking up. So actually I'm gonna to go to H6 and I'm gonna actually say, I want to find whatever name is in B6 and I want it to look in column B at all those names. And I want it to bring back the region, the department and the earnings related to that name. I'm gonna do that with an X lookup. It will do all three answers in one without us having to do multiple formulas. We're gonna do equal X, the letter X, double click on X lookup, if for some reason you do not see that as a function in your list, that's probably because you don't have the updated version of Excel, okay? But what it's looking for first is what is the lookup value? I'm gonna say I wanna look up B6, comma, it wants to know where is where am I gonna find that name? That's gonna be from B10 down through B49, B10 through B49. That's where it's going to find the name. Comma, it wants to know, well, where's the answer going to come from? Where's your answer going to come from? I want it to find region, department, and earnings. So I'm selecting everything from C10 through E49. So it's going to populate the answer for each of those going across. If I just wanted region, or I just wanted earnings or whatever, I could have selected just that column. Once I'm done, I control enter, 
and it automatically will populate the region, the department, and the earnings based on whatever name you have on cell B6. If the name changes on B6, it's going to automatically update your answers everywhere, wherever your formulas were used. If this is a brand new formula for you, this X lookup, highly recommend giving it a try. It has it has been something I have wished for for several years. It also does an an normally we would do an H lookup and go down. I want to show you just a quick example of that. I'm going to find the profit percent based on my quarters and my totals here. I want to find the profit percent that matches the region. So what I'm going to do is an X lookup again. Because an X lookup doesn't have to look in columns, it can look in rows as well. So I want it to look up the region, which is currently quarter three, comma. Sorry, <laughs> that was me, <laughs> comma. I pressed the wrong button. I wanted to look within this range of cells to find that region, comma. I want the answer to come from the profit percent, which is the cells down in row 16 that match the same cell range. They're all going from B through F. Then I can control enter and I'm gonna find 22%, which is matching up with quarter three. If I change my region, it's gonna change the answer. So this is much easier than using an H lookup because an H lookup we have to count the rows going down. I have a couple of examples in here to show you in your that practice file that you can download. So you could take a look at how that formula worked versus this XLOOKUP. 100% I'm using XLOOKUP now. There are some huge advantages to using it. So I gave you some advantages, some VLOOKUP basics on 13 and 14. XLOOKUP does have a couple of different disadvantages, not enough to stop me from using it. One is it's not backwards compatible. So if you need to share this workbook with somebody in an older version of Excel, they can't, can't use it. So gave you a few differences between the XLOOKUP and the VLOOKUP just for future reference. Okay. And the rest of the handout does include some additional information that I wanted to make sure I shared with you. We don't have time, of course, today to do all these, but I wanted to give you some information about consoling, consolidating data together, as well as just a little bit on charts. A chart could be created by just selecting a range of cells and then going to your insert tab. So like if I select, I'll go back to references here. And if I select my quarters, with my names, I could go to the insert tab, click recommended charts, and it's gonna show me every chart type that it would recommend based on the cells that I selected. Once I click okay, I have my chart. I could stop right there without having to change anything if I wanted to, but you get different tools on the ribbon. You get all these chart style options, which can change formatting. It can add and remove different elements to your chart or you could use quick layouts to add and remove elements as well. All depends on how you wanna have your chart look. It stays connected to the original data so that if the information changes on your cells, it will automatically update your chart as well, no matter where the chart is, okay? Well, that was our last topic for this session. Andrew, did we have any questions from the group? There we go. Uh, nothing else popped up, but I'll uh, give everyone a chance now to chime in with anything else that's come up or any sort of adjacent uh, questions they might have about Excel. Yes. Get this is a... Pro this is a program that I see a lot of people use on a daily basis, and just finding some efficiencies like this can be very helpful. These are kind of everyday things you can be using. Absolutely. Yeah, the X lookup change was really nice when, oh, when I discovered that. It was, so it was quite helpful. Yeah. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Blessing in disguise there, I tell you. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. 
All right, I think uh, no, no more questions have popped up. Lots of thanks. Uh, thank you everyone for attending. Yes, um, thank you. I do have a couple of uh, reminders here. We have a couple of upcoming trainings uh, in the near future, cybersecurity user level, everyone should attend that. And then Visio and Teams on November 4th and 9th. Uh, and again, we'll be sending out a survey uh, after this along with the recording. We really appreciate if you could send that out to us. And uh, if you have any interest in private training, something specific or targeted to, to your organization, you can reach out to us at training at smartdolphins.com. We do offer that as well as suggestions. If there's any topic that we haven't covered here and you'd like to see, uh, please let us know. Uh, and you can always reach us by phone. Awesome. All right. All right. Thank you, Jolyn. And thank You're you. You're welcome. Have a great rest.